My name is Jeremy Stern. I'm a 2014 scholar with the Security Forum. I'm here to introduce the next session, reflecting on the 9-11 Commission, Are We Safer Today? This year marks the 10th anniversary of the 9-11 Commission. How much safer are we, and how much safer do we need to be? It will be moderated by Mr. Ryan Lizza, Washington correspondent for The New Yorker. Mr. Lizza covers the White House, Congress, and national politics. He's also written for The New Republic, GQ, The New York Times, Washington Monthly, and The Atlantic. The Consequentialist, Ryan's article about Barack Obama's foreign policy, won the 2012 National Press Club's Hood Award for Diplomatic Correspondence. And with that, Ryan, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Thanks, everyone. Uh, let me uh, introduce our excellent panel today. Uh, all the way on the left, we have uh, Jeremy Bash. Jeremy, um, I'm not going to run through everyone's resume, but I'll try and hit some highlights for each of you. Uh, Jeremy, of course, was the former Chief of Staff to the Secretary of Defense former chief of staff to the director of the CIA. Uh, may have been the same person, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, for, and, the, and for that, he was the chief counsel on the House Intelligence Committee. Um, and Jeremy, you at the time, you were involved, with, you were on the House Intelligence Committee when some of the post-9-11 reorganization was being pushed through. Uh, Charles Allen uh, has more titles at the CIA than I have time to get through. He spent 40 years at the CIA. He's currently the principal at the Chertoff Group. Um, he, among his uh, many uh, distinguished uh, positions at the CIA, was the assistant director of Central Intelligence uh, for Collection, and he was also the undersecretary for intelligence analysis at the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, additionally, he was the CIA's national intelligence officer. Uh, for warning, uh, among many other, uh, many other roles. Thanks for being here, Charlie. Uh, Richard Benvenista uh, is the, one of the former commissioners of the 9-11 Commission, uh, and uh, most uh, perhaps equally famously was the, one of the lead prosecutor for the Watergate uh, Committee. And finally, on uh, my immediate left, Michael Chertoff, who is the executive chairman of the Chertoff Group, um, he was the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security from 2004 to 2009 uh, and was also the head of the Department of Justice's criminal division um, during a time when he investigated uh, some of the perpetrators of 9-11, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Correct. So uh, there's a lot to cover. There's very gen we have a very general topic, so let's uh, not feel too hemmed in by, uh, by, by, what, uh, <coughs> by, by the title of uh, the panel. But since it is the 10th anniversary of the 9-11 Commission's report, let's just start with some words from each of you about what that report, um, what, what, what recommendations were implemented and the, how successful they were. And let's, let's start in this first round with some of the sort of the basic bureaucratic uh, recommendations, the DNI, the NCTC. Um, how have they fared 10 years later? And uh, why don't we start uh, with Richard, since you were uh, on the commission. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Uh, we we uh, uh, give good grades uh, for the most part in connection with the implementation of our recommendations. Virtually all of them have been implemented either by legislation or executive order. Uh, the NCTC has been said uh, here uh, repeatedly has been an overwhelming success. Uh, the creation of the DNI uh, has over time evolved to a place where we can now say, uh, having spoken to the heads of uh, uh, former and uh, presently uh, the heads of uh, the intelligence community, uh, is, uh, is operating in the way uh, which it, uh, we intended for it to operate. There's a way to go, and there are cautions, but uh, we're giving it good marks, uh, and it's operating well. The primary uh, takeaway from our report uh, was the urgent need to foster uh, the uh, uh, ability of the IC, communicate, uh, uh, the IC world uh, to cooperate and to share information. Sharing information was the number one priority of our message. And uh, we can say that for all uh, intents and purposes, that is working very well. There's some work to be done, perhaps on the state and lo local level, uh, where uh, uh, they can get more information, and we hope uh, that will happen over time. Uh, but that's operating very well. 
the area in which uh, uh, our recommendation was not adopted, uh, as has been discussed here this morning and throughout this conference, is the area of Congress reforming itself. Uh, we predicted it would be the most difficult area uh, of our recommendations to achieve, and unfortunately, we were right. Uh, we went from 88 uh, committees and subcommittees overseeing uh, uh, Homeland Security, the Department of Homeland Security, to now 92. So we slid backwards instead of making progress forwards. Um, there is a level of urgency, I think, to this recommendation, and we have repeated it now on the 10th anniversary, uh, and that is this is a national security issue. It's not just moving the boxes around. It's uh, not just a bureaucratic turf issue, although that's a strong component of the resistance to change. Uh, it is a national security issue to get this right and to stop the nonsense. Secretary Churchill. I, I, I agree with Richard. I think a lot of progress has been made, and I also agree with him. The one big unfinished recommendation is the uh, jurisdictional issue with Congress, uh, not just a wiring diagram issue, but actually something that has interfered with our ability to create um, laws that would protect us against certain threats because the threat falls in the seam between two committees, and they can't get it together to write the law. So. It's a serious issue. Um, you know, I think the challenge as we go forward uh, is to make sure we don't backslide. Uh, take the intelligence community, the, the, the sharing of information. Um, I do think we've made a lot of progress. I fear we are going to start to see a push to dismantle a lot of the sharing we've had, uh, partly as a result of Snowden, partly as a result of the fact that we've been very successful sharing over the years, um, and partly the natural bureaucratic tendency I think there are going to be arguments we hear now that there's too much sharing, that we need to start to compartmentalize more. Uh, the Europeans have, a, by the way, a very different philosophy. The Europeans believe you shouldn't share. Everything should be kept in a little box. And one of the struggles we had with them when I was in office in terms of how we dealt with things like uh, information about travelers from Europe to the US was we wanted to broaden the ability to share and analyze, and the Europeans were offended by that. And again, the Snowden issue has just added I think additional fuel to that to that controversy. So I think we're going to need to fight to keep some of the th progress we've made in effect. We feared that, actually, in looking at this 10-year retrospective, and we talk about the logical fear that Snowden would force back into silos um, the cooperation that has uh, occurred over the last 10 years, and we would backslide. We were uh, happy to hear from uh, the members, the leaders of the intelligence community who say that no, uh, they have not detected that as of yet, uh, but uh, obviously it's something to care about and to uh, worry about uh, for the future. Charles, let me, you, you, at the time that, this, uh, that the law implementing the 9-11 recommendations was passed, the CIA was considered the big loser in that law. So power was being taken away from the CIA and, and put in the hands of the DNI. Um, what did you think at the time, and what do you think now about those changes? That's a great question, Ryan. I was flying back from Iraq when uh, the law was passed, I guess, in December 04. Or, yes, it was December of war, and I was, I was reading about it, and I was saying, well, what does this do to the Central Intelligence Agency, which was my home and for decades, and I knew it would, things were going to dramatically change. And, uh, but uh, over time, I believe what the 9-11 Commission, in principle and in, in fundamental areas, recommended, uh, I believe those recommendations were correct that uh, at, because we had to change the paradigm dramatically. The country wanted it, the people wanted it. Uh, we have a direct, we've started with, with uh, Ambassador Negroponte, and now we have uh, General James Clapper. And the focus has gradually uh, changed to trying to integrate the agencies of the community, particularly to get them to share together. Uh, it is also focused uh, very heavily on trying the DNI, on trying to get the budgets aligned. And uh, some of this, I think, is, has been very positive. 
There are many challenges remains. There's ambiguity in, in the law and the authorities and responsibilities of a director of national intelligence. And CIA, and you have a guy like John Brennan who, in talking to him, he has been consistent in his support of the DNI, which was something that was not evident in the first, I think Ambassador Negroponte could you know, tell some more stories on that. CIA was not necessarily cooperative at first. Now it's a very, it's a far more integrated process. I think the problems uh, of information sharing, I agree with the Secretary, but getting back to what Richard talked about, we still have to do better uh, in information sharing on it, among the intelligence agencies with, the, with, the, with Homeland Security, NCTC under the leadership of Mike Leiter and now Matt Olson, I think has, has made that much better. But the sharing of federal information, intelligence information, particularly down to state and local, to the police departments, uh, to the fusion centers, to the JTTFs, and closer relations between DHS intelligence and the FBI intelligence and operations, I think, ha have to be improved. I think there's a lot that needs to be done. I believe the Snowden uh, effects are having a, a, a very serious uh, problem within the intelligence community. It's it will create additional problems. Here, I think, though, Jim Clapper is doing a good job by working on integration of the information technologies by having this large program of uh, the big four agencies, and CIA has its own commercial cloud for information technology. And the whole idea is to be able to put it in the cloud and to share information quickly, to tag the information, uh, to the right person so you'll have security that can withstand security audits. This is, this is a very large IT enterprise, it has a lot, it's very ambitious, and it will be criticized here and there, but over time I believe that is the right way to go. So I think the information sharing part, which Richard talked about, remains a, a, a challenge. We've got to do better. Uh, there was, we, we should have learned from 25 December 2009 when we had not quickly shared enough all the information on Umar Farouk uh, Matab, uh, Abdel Matalib. Uh, there's where we might, we came close to a disaster, I believe, on a Delta airliner. But we've come a long way. And uh, as Undersecretary, under Secretary Chertoff, I worked very hard to get first the intelligence operating, the, the intelligence arms of the operating components to work together. And my successor today, Frank Taylor, is working hard too getting information sharing within the Department of Homeland Security and then be able to share down at the state and local level is one of his greatest uh, challenges. Jeremy, the debate at the time was between those, and this is sort of a follow-up to something that Rep Representative Harmon was talking about at the end of the last session. The debate at the time was between more centralized intelligence versus people mostly associated with the defense community that wanted sort of defense primacy uh, in intelligence. From your vantage point on the Hill and at the CIA and the Pentagon, th did the fears of the Cheneys and the Rumsfelds of the time uh, come true in terms of limiting defense primacy and intelligence? And then I'll let you say whatever you want about this, but just specifically, who has been the most successful DNI and why? And, and don't worry, there are no former DNIs in this room. <laughs> John Negroponte, for sure. <laughs> But it is a serious question. What, what's the, this is, you know, we're, we're, we're far enough along. the most successful since <laughs> <laughs> Well, look, first, the answer to your question, Ryan, is that no, those fears have not come to fruition. In fact, I think the most important innovation we've seen since the Commission's recommendations, and really the most important national tool we've had, has been the fusion of military and intelligence capabilities right at the tip of the spear to go after al Qaeda, the organization that attacked us. That fusion, that cooperation downrange has been unprecedented. It's, it's not something, it was alluded to in the Commission's reports, but it's not the product of wiring diagrams or boxes on an org chart. It's really the product of leadership and an understanding that unless these previously stove-piped stove entities can work together downrange mm -hmm. to actually go after leaders of Al-Qaeda, we're not going to get the job done. And I think you've seen that across the board. There's been a lot of focus on UAV operations, but my friends, you have to realize it hasn't just been UAV operations, it's been man platforms, it's been interdictions by local security forces, we've had hellebore assaults, we've had a range of direct action, we've had a range of national tools, national tools of, of our power that have gone and taken these leaders off the battlefield. And it, of course, we know of the paradigmatic case of bin Laden where 
at the CIA, the CIA developed the intelligence to figure out, OK, who is on the third deck of that home in Abbottabad down the end of a dead end street? And that was 99% of the hard work, if you ask the special operators. But then even inside the agency, the leaders of the National Clandestine Service, they came to then Director Panetta and they said, you know what? This is not really our role, our job to finish here. We really have to bring in Admiral McRaven. We have to really bring in the soft elements because they're the ones who do this all the time. And that cooperation, it's, it was the opposite of turf battles. It was, it was the knowledge that, hey, we can take this only so far. We've got to bring in our partners. That was the paradigmatic case, but it's been, it's been repeated over and over again. And if you look at you know, Atiyah Abdul Rahman, Salah al-Somali, and, and uh, Ilias Kashmira, Baitullah Massoud, and Nabhan, and, and, and every other senior leader who we've taken off the battlefield, it's been a joint effort between the military and intelligence. That is an incredibly important innovation. I just want to say one final thing about this, which is that as we wind down our effort, as we wound down our effort in Iraq, and as we wound down, wind down our troop presence in Afghanistan, that's going to be one of the casualties, which is that I worry that without a, a large forward presence and people working in the field, we're going to lose that, that cooperation and that capability. And we have to figure out a way as a nation to maintain it. Yeah, I want to get to that, because that's something that Richard's latest, the 9-11 Commission's updated report um, uh, mentions as, as a concern. But did you, did you want to uh, talk about DNI that you thought was most successful? They, they've, all, they've really all had their strengths, and, and, but I think the nation owes a debt of gratitude to Jim Clapper because, first of all, he ran two intelligence agencies previously. So he really understands what the intelligence community needs. And, and I have to say, as Jane Harmon would say, the, the law that the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act is 50% law, 50% leadership. And, and that's what we all experience in our own jobs. The law can only take us so far. We need to have good leaders and great leaders. And, and Director Clapper really understands the role of the DNI, and he has been an incredible leader for the community. Richard, the, your, the, co the commission's original recommendation was to have this person inside the White House, right? Now that eventually, through the legislative process, did not uh, happen. Um, is that, uh, are there any drawbacks to the current system? Would you go back to, would you still today recommend having them in the White House? Because one, one of the concerns in the Obama years, frankly, has been that the president, um, frankly, has gone around the DNI and he wants to talk directly to the director of central intelligence or the other uh, directors of intelligence agencies and the fear <coughs> that the DNI would be cut out has actually come to pass. With, with that getting into personalities, yeah. uh, Ryan, the uh, we wouldn't walk it back. I think, uh, as Jeremy points out, uh, General Clapper uh, has, through a force of personality and experience, uh, uh, seized the reins uh, and uh, has uh, performed and will perform, in our view, in the way in which we intended uh, the DNI to work. And uh, the focus uh, has to be on uh, integration of the intelligence committee, uh, community's resources and uh, not creating a separate bureaucracy. That was our fear. Uh, we said so in our report. We say it again now. Uh, that's the fear in Washington always. Uh, but uh, we're giving good marks. Uh, to General Clapper and the way in which uh, DNI is now working. Charlie, it looks like yeah, you want to I add something. I just wanted to say, I, putting, putting the Director of National Intelligence in the West Wing would be very unwise. Okay. It gets the, the DNI who has to be independent, who has to bring the bad news consistently at times to the President in a, in a very powerful environment, close to the presidency, where you can easily forget your responsibilities to bring that bad news. Uh, it, and I think inevitably a, a DNI in the West Wing would be accused of politicizing intelligence, something you can't do, because you, you have to be strong and go tell the president what he doesn't want to hear. Uh, presidents may or may not receive it, may not act on it, and that's the president's prerogative and his, and his, and his, and his, and his NSC. But you have to have a little bit of distance I think it works well. I think, you know, talking to John Brennan, he works very closely uh, with the DNI. And the DNI is there in the daily intelligence briefings with, with the president on uh, the president's daily brief. Uh, 
he clearly defers to people like John Brennan if there needs to be a deep dive on a clandestine operation or covert ac action. And, and I think it's a very comfortable relationship. I think it's, it, it has worked its way out with experience and with time in ways which I think are exactly appropriate. The DNI is a little distant from the president geographically, and I think it works fine. I agree with Charlie. Yeah. Secretary Churchill, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think that I think that you know the challenge for the DNI is always what is your role vis-a-vis -vis the heads of the operational agencies. Um, you know, there's always a temptation in a position like that to want to actually be a super operator that impinges upon the authority and the management of the individual agencies. Um, at the same time, you also want to be the principal interface with the president. Um, I would say that actually we're at a stage now where the DNI needs to do two things. One is um, exercise what I would call adult supervision over the community a as a whole. Um, there's been a little bit of controversy in the press about whether some of what we have done in the intelligence collection area vis-a-vis -vis some of our European allies was wise or unwise. Um, there are often trade-offs. Um, it is true the intelligence machinery sometimes operates on autopilot. If, you, if the policymakers say, collect on this topic, they'll collect everything on the topic. Um, and what you sometimes need is someone to say, time out. Um, we got to weigh the, the cost of a certain type of collection against the benefit. The second thing I think the DNI has to do now more than ever is to explain what the value of the intelligence community is to the American public. Um, you know, there's now a, a, there are now voices on both uh, the right and the left, both Republicans and Democrats, who at some point start to question whether we need intelligence, whether the whole thing is, is more than we need. Um, and it's hard for the individual agency heads to defend themselves, A, because they wind up in a situation where they're personally involved, and B, because you have to look at the enterprise as a whole. It's not any one thing. It is bringing it together. I think the DNI has to systematically educate the American public, uh, including what we've actually tangibly derived. And in this respect, I have to say one positive thing that emerged from Snowden, and I want to be clear, I, I have nothing but contempt for Snowden. And it's using an analogy that was described earlier. To me, he's like a guy who burns down the house to show that the house was flammable. It's not the way you do it. But I do think that by declassifying the court opinions and some of the rules around the way we collect, it actually made the intelligence community look good. And I think that kind of uh, declassification, explaining concretely when we have gotten benefit, would actually build up a reservoir of goodwill, which the community needs now. But let's be honest, Secretary Churchill, none of that would have happened ab absent Snowden. Right. Yeah, but that's there was not, no that, pressure building for intelligence transparency in the country or in the Obama administration absent this. Yeah, we person. wouldn't. We wouldn't have built. Uh, you know what we've built up had Bin Laden not blown up the World Trade Center. That doesn't. You don't yeah. credit him with that. Yeah. Um, it was the wrong way. <laughs> it, was, it was the wrong way to do it. Um, I don't think Snowden's motivations were, were, were admirable, but I do think an incidental byproduct of revealing what we did. Um, is uh, a recognition that this has actually been a very disciplined process. And, and I think even before this, a lot of us on the inside said, you know, not only could we afford to declassify more, it would benefit us. Because I remember I used to go out and talk about, like to the Europeans, about what we collect on travelers. And I went to Europe, and I, to the European Parliament, and I said, look, here are ex exactly the kinds of things we have found um, that we would not have gotten had we not been given this information. And it had an impact. It didn't convert them, but it, it slowed them up a little bit. Go ahead, Richard. Ryan, to that point, uh, the 9-11 Commission recommended the creation of a Civil Liberties and Privacy Board. Yeah. Um, unfortunately... It's pretty much been asleep until this last year. Well, it's not that they've been asleep. It hasn't uh, been uh, enacted. Uh, uh, the Bush administration created something with no authority, and uh, they were folding napkins on the Titanic uh, for a couple of years, nothing happened. Yeah. And then um, uh, President Obama was slow in, uh, in appointing the uh, balance of the, uh, of the commission. Uh, Congress delayed his appointment of a chairman for a year um, for partisan reasons, unfortunately. But now they're up and running. We had hoped that um, that commission uh, would in fact uh, mediate the discussion in America 
uh, between uh, security and privacy. And uh, now it's taken Snowden uh, for us to have that discussion uh, in, a, uh, in a crisis situation rather than a, a more uh, reasoned way. So we attempted that. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't successful. They've now weighed in, and uh, uh, they seem to be functioning uh, as we intended. So the discussion is critical, I think, uh, to the way we go forward. And to Michael's point, and uh, part of the recommendation in our 10-year retrospective, is that um, the president and the agencies <coughs> discuss, for example, uh, why we need NSA uh, and what NSA does to protect the United States, particularly in this time of uh, extraordinary uh, vulnerability to cyber attack. And um, again, to uh, Michael's point, and as we say in our report, uh, it's important uh, to be granular in discussing the successes that NSA has made. You know, we've come from the point where NSA was no such agency, and nobody talked about anything, to now uh, some degree uh, of uh, discussion. Uh, we need more of it so that the American public understands that there's another side uh, to the privacy equation. It's not to say that historically there aren't problems and that we should not be aware of the potential for overreach and abuse. But having said all of that, it also needs to be said that NSA is providing an extraordinary service to the protection of the United States. Charlie? I just wanted to add, uh, and I agree with Richard, and the secretary is that the need for the community leaders, including Jim Clapper, and he's starting to do this. He's speaking at universities now, and he has a list. I talked to him recently about a list of universities that he's going to go out and, and address. He didn't have Berkeley on the list, but he had a, he had a quite a quite a quite a good list of and quite a cross sections of colleges he's going to address. John Brennan speaks. He spoke at the Woodrow Wilson Institute. And, stated some things publicly that had never been formally acknowledged by the U.S. government, but he did it formally. Uh, he clearly, this is, this is something that's really needed. And there needs to be intelligence outreach uh, and closer relationships with the private sector. When I spoke earlier about information sharing and working more closely and explaining, and DHS can play a crucial role in this, explaining uh, the need for intelligence, the need for information sharing, it gets down to the private sector, which is so ably represented here in this audience. Well, as an alum of Berkeley, I'm going to see if I can hook Clapper up with, uh, <laughs> with the school. OK, please do that. I uh, spoke to Berkeley once, but uh, the, uh, the students were fine, but the faculty seemed to be uh, on a different planet. <laughs> uh, no comment on that. Um, so, Richard, let's, let's talk a little bit about the, the report in, in your hand. Um, the original 9-11 commission, one of the basic, uh, you, you've got, you brought, brought the prop. Always, the 9-11 commission was always good at uh, the salesmanship part of uh, the commission <laughs> job. Um, the, one of the lines from the original report was, of course, no sanctuaries for terrorist groups. Um, in, the, in, your, in your 10 year anniversary uh, report, you talk about what's going on in Iraq and Syria with ISIS. You talk about um, the removal of US troops from Afghanistan <coughs> by the end of the year. And you sort of warn the American people that we may be back to a situation worse than pre-9-11 in terms of just the, the areas um, across the Middle East and Africa available to, uh, to terrorists as sanctuaries. Combine that with what you describe in your report as a sort of counterterrorism fatigue in the United States, um, a sense that the public doesn't want to hear about this all the time. Um, and then, as Jeremy was, uh, I think it was Jeremy was pointing out bef before, the politics of both parties, there is definitely a mood in this country to look inward, to take care of problems uh, in America, and that we have been at war for, for a good long time. Your report is trying to tell the president, no, that's, you, you can't do that. You need to be out warning the American people uh, about the dangers. Um, what's, the, 
What's the, what does a policymaker like the president do with, the, with the, the, those um, issues the way you've laid them out? Well, the takeaway uh, from our 10-year retrospective is that the American public has to understand that while uh, our uh, intelligence community and our uh, Department of Defense and uh, our forces have been extraordinarily successful in decimating core al-Qaeda, uh, including, uh, of course, uh, taking out uh, Osama bin Laden. Uh, the, uh, the world remains a dangerous place from the standpoint of uh, the lethality and the potential uh, of these elements in the world. Um, the world has changed with, respect, uh, with respect to terrorism. Um, uh, Al-Qaeda's uh, influence uh, has metastasized uh, throughout a broader swath uh, of the Middle East than previously, and uh, particularly with respect uh, to ISIS, uh, we point out uh, the fear, uh, which is a legitimate fear and an alarm that individuals traveling from Europe and the United States, uh, about 100 Americans are thought to have traveled uh, um, to Syria, uh, who are at this moment being trained, uh, further radicalized, uh, have instruction in bomb making and other uh, potentially lethal uh, uh, ways in which they can attack the West. Uh, they have passports that allow travel um, throughout Europe and potentially to the United States, and of course the Americans have U.S. passports. So uh, we point out that the headline is do not be complacent uh, because we have not suffered a major attack. Uh, we, we have uh, suffered uh, lone wolf attacks, uh, most particularly the Boston Marathon. We have responded to that. We could have done better on the intelligence side, but we responded to that in a way that shows American resiliency, which is extraordinarily important. Uh, the whole idea of Boston strong is a message back in the teeth of the terrorists that we will not be terrorized. We will not be frightened by what you do. We will respond in a proportionate way uh, that is responsive to the threat. And so the balance, uh, Ryan, uh, is one that politically needs to be kept in perspective. We don't want to return to a time when uh, the American public was told, you know, be afraid, be very afraid, and there are political aspects to that. Uh, we live in a, uh, in a, uh, in a society which is a subject uh, to pendulum swings, and the pendulum has swung back in another direction. Uh, what we say in our report is that we must continue uh, to uh, support the intelligence community and our efforts uh, to combat terrorism uh, because the threat is real. One of the lines that I'll, one second, Jeremy. One of the lines that jumped out at me in the report in this, on the same issue was where it says that the um, inability or reluctance of the leadership in the United States to engage with that part of the world is partly responsible for this. And to me, that sounded like what you guys were saying is that um, part of this is the president's fault. Let me but start with you, Secretary Chertoff. Um, how, much, how much is the, the problem that, uh, that um, the 9-11 Commission's updated report lays out, how much is that the fault of the current president? Well, I don't think you can say it's <clears throat> the fault of the United States or the fault of a president. I, I think the, the issue has been how have we reacted to developments in the Middle East and in Africa that have created, uh, let's say, new platforms or enhanced platforms for terrorist attacks? And I can think of at least a couple areas where if you look backward, you say, hmm, maybe we should have done something a little bit different. One is Libya. We, uh, we went into Libya. Uh, we, the mission quickly became top of Gaddafi, but then hands off. And it's almost the reverse of what we did in Iraq. We you know, took out the leader, and then we stood back. The consequence of that was a state that is not running itself properly. Um, they opened up the jails in some of the worst 
uh, jihadi extremists, violent extremists, were let out, and Libya was a prime recruiting ground. A lot of those uh, surface-to-air missiles, no one knows where they are, but they're not where they're supposed to be. Um, and if you look back at that, you say, you know, if we were going to get involved in Libya, maybe we needed to at least make sure it was stabilized. The second issue, which I won't rehearse at length, is Syria, um, where early on we had voices talking about the need to find uh, more moderate members of the opposition, support them, sustain them, and empower them. We didn't really do that. And what happened is the most extreme elements uh, began to recruit people because when, when you have uh, young folks enlisting in a, quote, cause, they're going to look for the most active and aggressive platform. And so it was al-Nusra first, and then it became ISIS that said, hey, look at us. We have money. We're willing to do some serious fighting. And they grew at the expense of the other groups. Uh, and of course, now we find ourselves with a position that, that, that they have in the Middle East. I mean, I think, the, the, to me, the message is this. And again, I think you've got to speak to the American people. Um, and I, I, both parties have elements that reject this, and I think you've got to confront it. Uh, it is not someone else's problem. Uh, we're not back to the old days when the oceans protected ourselves. We're not going to dial back travel and, and trade and the flow of co communications and finance. Um, we need to understand that what happens over there does not stay over there. It comes over here. And I think that is a message. It may be hard for a president to deliver when we've got other things at home. But if you don't deliver it, we're going to be more and more exposed. Right. Jeremy, you want to add something? Then I would also add a question well, for Charlie, and then we'll do some qu audience just questions. Just pick up on the word complacency. Uh, it's worse than complacency. I actually think all the conversation now is about dialing back and removing counterterrorism tools. What can we take out of our arsenal? What authorities should we strip away? And I think given the assessment that Secretary Chertoff laid out, and which we've heard over the last couple of days, that essentially, yeah, core al-Qaeda may be on the downswing, but al-Qaeda-ism is clearly on the upswing. And if you think about the range of problems we face that have, that have developed and been created over the last several years, I think we have to have a conversation about what new tools we need and what tools we want. The best passage from the 9-11 Commission report, if you go back and read it, is a great passage about the failure of imagination, about how it was very difficult for policymakers to have imagined that hijackers would board civilian airliners and crash them into airplanes. Now, my friends, just think about what we've seen over the last three months. We've seen sub-state actors, sub-national actors, shoot down a civilian airliner. We've seen, in the context of Hamas, a sub-state actor range an entire country, an entire civilian population with rockets, missiles, and artillery. And we've seen, in the case of Syria and Iraq, a terrorist organization march across the border and threaten a sovereign government. We have not seen any of those three things in the last decade, and now we've seen them all of a sudden all happen in the last three months. And so just think about a failure of imagination. We have to be able to imagine what these organizations may try to do. Charlie, did you want to add anything to that? I Does wanted to add to that because I believe it's <coughs> going to also take some reorientation inside the intelligence community. Uh, at one time, and it was easy in the Cold War to sit and do strategic assessments. We didn't do warning as well as we should have, but today we have become increasingly very tactical and very short term in our thinking uh, across all the intelligence agencies. We are not doing that deep thinking. When the Arab Spring occurred, the intelligence community looked at Tunisia very tactically and did not really foresee the contagion. Uh, it's hard to predict. I don't believe you can predict the future, the future, but you can look at indicators and you can look at various potential outcomes. Uh, Ambassador Negropompty knows how this is done. And, and we saw the same, I thought, in, in Crimea and, and Ukraine, where we could do a lot more. And, in, and I believe it's going to take more, reorienta more reorientation of the way we do collection and analysis in the U.S. intelligence community. Doesn't mean more dollars, but it means more focus and rewarding those, rewarding those who look more strategically at our problems. We're not as strategic nearly as we used to, and we reward people with promotion and awards and bonuses for doing that tactical takedown. Uh, that's, that's not the future. I, uh, we've got to look, I think uh, General Flynn is here, and I think he agrees with the idea that we've got to look uh, longer term while we still do uh, the uh, countering al-Qaeda, 
and doing tactical things, dealing with other uh, threats around the world. We just have to change. All right, thank you. Let's open it up to some questions from the audience. Um, and there are some folks with microphones. Uh, yes, this gentleman here. Thank you very much, Michael Hirschman, the Fairfax Group. Uh, the process of, of granting and recognizing uh, clearances, well, I'm trying to think of the right adjective for it. Insanity comes to mind, but I, I'm not sure that's totally descriptive. I mean, you have people that have high-level clearances in one agency that can't even enter the building of another agency. You have thousands of people <laughs> that have clearances that shouldn't have them, that don't need them. You have people that need clearances where it takes sometimes as long as a year to get them. Now, we've been talking about very complex and serious issues. This is a simple bureaucratic function. Why can't our government get it right? Who wants to take that one? Well, I, I want to take that one because I found what you said was true, uh, particularly when I was Under Secretary for Intelligence at DHS. Uh, when I wanted to, I had a top secret SCI cleared officer saying DIA, I wanted to bring him over to help with my information architecture. It had to go through security and we, it took weeks to just get his clearances transferred from DIA to DHS and, and get approvals to start bringing him into, into my building. Uh, so when I left government in 2009 and joined Secretary Chertoff, I also became the senior advisor to the Intelligence and National Security Alliance in a trade association that illuminates hard issues like what you're addressing. And for four years now, I've headed the uh, Security Policy Reform Council, which is composed of government as well as, uh, as and primarily the private sector. But we have the National Counterterrorism Executive sitting in on our meetings, the Defense Security Services. We have CIA representatives sitting in. We're looking at ways to do that and reform it. You're right, it should be a lot easier. It, and I'm also writing a classified paper for CIA on how it does its security clearances. And CIA has actually improved. I went in thinking it was still a little in the dark ages, but it has improved significantly. The problem has been that we're living with old rules and, and not using technology, not using it nearly enough. Uh, and. I, I, am, I am believe that we can do continuous evaluation uh, of those in, uh, to ward off the insider threat. We have the technology to do that. Uh, and, and believe me, a red flag will show up if an individual is, is downloading something he or she should not. But we have to do it broader. We have to be able to get contractors moving from one contract to another and get his or her clearances passed. We're in the, we're in the and, and, secret, and the DNI again has endorsed what we're doing because his people are directly engaged with us. It's a, it's a new effort. Uh, it's under, uh, under Chairman Negroponte because he also chairs the Intelligence and National Security Alliance. So we're making incremental progress, not as much as I would like, but I am very delighted at your question. This is being addressed and the DNI knows about this problem. Ryan, but I, I just say that the process is still far too laborious, particularly for Americans with uh, of ethnic diversity, particularly Muslim Americans. I mean, we all know stories of people who have waited months, if not years, to be cleared because they sit in front of the person uh, investigating their clearance and they say, do you have any relatives abroad or have you ever traveled abroad? And it's like, yeah, that's why I'm sitting here. That, that's why I, I, I'm trying to do this job. And, and I think our whole system is broken, actually, for clearing particularly Muslim Americans. And then we kind of wonder, well, why can't we understand the Muslim world? I mean, one quarter of the people in the world are, are Muslim, and as Farah Pandith will, will, will educate us in her uh, forthcoming book, which is a great title, Hashtag Youthquake, half the people in the Muslim world are under 30. So if we don't have people who can understand, speak the language, and assess how those global trends affect our security. We're, we're cooked. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Over here, there's a question right here. Thank you. It's Hugo Rosemont from King's College London. And with regards to the panel's emphasis on the need for information sharing and also the development of new tools in the counterterrorism um, response, 
To what extent should there be a significantly greater emphasis on international cooperation on intelligence issues? Thank you. Who'd like to start with the Secretary well, I, can, I mean, you know, I, I, I think international cooperation is critical, and unfortunately, we're, we're encountering some headwinds. I can tell you from my time, and, and, and Charlie Allen remembers yeah. this, we had a terrific cooperation with allies around the world, Europe, uh, Middle East, um, and a, a lot of it, of course, not you know, well publicized for obvious reasons, but very, very important when you're dealing with a global adversary to have the ability to connect international dots, not just national dots. Uh, the challenge we have now, I hate to keep bringing back the Snowden issue, in the wake of Snowden, and particularly the way it's been spun, uh, there are now um, publics in Europe in particular <clears throat> that are antagonistic to the idea of sharing. And unfortunately, actually, they're going to wind up paying a higher price because uh, my experience is a lot of the benefit of sharing with our allies inured to our allies as you know, maybe even more than to us. So again, this is an issue which is going to require leadership from our allies as well as ourselves if we're not to create a dangerous gap between what we know and what they know. Excellent. Any other questions back there? Rui. I know a few of you up there. Um, one of the biggest criticisms of the 9-11 Commission recommendations was that we were too easy on the FBI and by not creating a separate domestic intelligence agency. W what should the FBI's role be in being a domestic intelligence agency and given Jane Harmon's recent comments of American public really doesn't want a domestic intelligence agency? Well, we, uh, we spent a lot of time, as uh, Bob Mueller uh, uh, will remember, uh, thinking about uh, our recommendation. And uh, in fact, uh, we, we spoke to the leaders of uh, British intelligence, MI5, uh, as part of our consideration. And uh, uh, we thought it would be ill-advised, consider you know, the, the concern of uh, uh, some American <coughs> uh, uh, spokespeople uh, uh, to uh, the FBI's intelligence role domestically uh, if we had recommended the creation of an MI5 uh, here in the United States. So we uh, concluded that what was necessary was a transformation of the FBI uh, into uh, a component that provides for domestic intelligence and anti-terrorism. Uh, uh, in addition to their uh, extraordinary history of law enforcement capability. And so looking back on it, uh, we have seen under uh, uh, Director Mueller's uh, uh, a very able leadership a transformation of the Bureau. It's not in, uh, certainly not a finished product, uh, but uh, great strides have been made in that uh, direction. and. Uh, uh, we spoke recently with Director Comey and have every reason to believe uh, that those efforts will continue. In the back there. Jeremy, you mentioned the, the passage from the 9-11 Commission report about the failure of imagination. Charlie, you talked uh, about too tactical approach to intelligence right now and the need to look at things more strategically. If you look at what happened with the fall of Mosul, this was a strategic disaster for us. We're not unique in terms of having intelligence failures right now. The Israelis didn't know anything about the scope of the tunnels. Do these developments require us to have the intelligence community take not just a fresh look uh, generally at the region, but maybe take a fresh look at the assumptions it's making about the region? I'd be happy yeah. to uh, sp speak to that. Uh, yeah, we, we clearly have to get back to fundamentals, blocking and tackling, I think, as Mike Leiter would say, where we really do have to understand the whole idea of, of where we're going. The, we, we have not really thought ahead as much as we should, as coherently as we should. We will always be surprised. There will always be things we can't forecast. A, a Malaysian airliner coming out of the skies was totally uh, something you can't predict. But there are things that we can do better on. And, and we, I think uh, the leadership of the community recognizes this. 
I think we need to serve the president better in these issues, to be in the policy levels, to understand implications of what's occurring, even though we will not predict it, we certainly can offer outcomes that could be detrimental to U.S. national security interests. We, we did this pretty well. We had a different environment than the, than the fine fix and finish environment that we have to conduct today, but there's no question that this is an area that needs further attention. And uh, we're having a, a summit, uh, Ambassador Negroponte, uh, and uh, he, he chairs INSA and FCA, in 1819 uh, September in Washington, D.C., and it's, it talks about effectiveness, transparency, and, and accountability is a, is a title of this summit that's going to be open to everyone at the Omni Shoreham. And, and, one of the, and we're going to talk a lot about the whole issue of, of, of being able to anticipate and crises and to look at it in a slightly different vein. And I think that now is probably the right time to also think about, you know, we've been focused on Hamas, we've been focused on ISIS. Now's the right time to, to think also about Hezbollah because that's been kind of quiet. Um, it's been, it's been uh, under, under our radar, but of course Hezbollah controls large swaths of territory in Lebanon. They've got a major patron and sponsor in Iran, and they've shown that they've got the capability to conduct attacks uh, and to even have a, have a global footprint, a global supply chain. And, and I think the community cannot take its eye off that very important challenge. Now, let me add to that. They're, they're present in South America, and they have been historically. And to tie back to something Chairman McCall said earlier, uh, if we're going to be strategic, we ought to look at the impact of disorder in Central America, not just on the immediate issue we're having, but on the strategic problem it poses for Mexico and for, the, and for North America. Uh, when you start to have ungoverned spaces, in our own continent, and that's kind of what we're edging towards. Um, how about right there? Hi, Nikki Sutton, NCTC. Uh, I was interested to hear your comments about the politicization of intel and the efforts to remove that politicization by geographically not locating the, the director of national intelligence in the West Wing. Um, I'm interested in applying that, that idea to, to the NCTC model. Arguably one of the successes of NCTC and why it has succeeded in being able to provide what has been described here in the past few days as the threat picture on terrorism issues is because we were created in a way that very distinctly removed us from the politicization realm in that we don't have our own operational wing and intel collection apparatus by design. I wonder if you could comment, all of you or any of you, on the idea of applying a similar model to other threats, specifically things like potentially cyber, especially because that's an industry or a, a, an issue in which the private sector and private industry is arguably best positioned to respond or is best positioned to, to help drive our, our reaction as an intel community. I, I can start with it. Uh, I think you make a very good point. I, 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 we need to br find a way to bring together a platform to do analysis in real time on cyber threats. I know Rick Ledger. Um, and some people have argued that the NCTC model is, is a good model. You bring together capabilities of a lot of different agencies. You would have to have the private sector involved and, and have a direct interface there. Um, I, I, I could not agree more that the last place you want to put that is the White House. As sensitive as it would be to have uh, the NCTC housed in the White House, imagine if the internet, issues involving control of the internet were put in the White House. It would send exactly the wrong message. Um, I think my own view is you, know, you probably need a DHS to be the executive agent for this, but that you really want to create a, essentially a uh, quasi-independent platform for which you can share the information and analyze it. And you're right. it's not. Now, there's some operational things that have to happen uh, as a result of that, but that doesn't need to be run within that platform. Let, let, let me talk for a minute uh, just about the cyber threat, uh, which uh, has been discussed uh, uh, frequently throughout the, uh, the forum proceedings, uh, but not by us uh, this morning. Uh, that was the second area of uh, headline for the 9-11 Commission's retrospective, and that is in the 10 years since uh, we wrote our first report, uh, cyber has emerged as uh, perhaps the predominant threat uh, because of our reliance, um, which has only been increased uh, many-fold in this 
past 10 years on communication uh, and commerce uh, through electronic means. So we have created in our country by reason of our own technological innovation uh, and the great American <coughs> Uh, spirit uh, of innovation, a reliance uh, on those technologies that makes us perhaps more vulnerable than ever before in our history beyond the traditional borders. The border defenses of the United States mean nothing in the cyber realm. We can be attacked and have been attacked uh, from overseas in uh, in a nanoseconds uh, uh, to great detriment to our country. And that's why we, in our report, uh, highlight the fact that we need to be far more prepared in the cyber realm to defend ourselves against potential attacks. The cyber war has been going on. It's not something that we're waiting for. Those in this room know uh, perhaps better than most in this country. Uh, that we have been under attack. Uh, we have been under attack in the private sector and we have been under attack in the public sector. Uh, Chinese elements have attacked in the United States dissident Chinese groups uh, and in fact uh, have denied access to their uh, computer capabilities, their communication capabilities in the United States. So we have been attacked and we will expect to be attacked in the future, so that this is the other headline of our report, is that we must uh, take urgent steps to prepare ourselves. We have about a minute left. Did you, Charlie, you want to add something? I, I just and, wanted and to Jeremy. particularly commend NCT, NCTC uh, for not being operational. I think the 9-11 Commission, when it formed NCTC, not making it operational, we, are, we have scattered analysis today of the cyber threat. We need a more consolidated way of doing it the way the Secretary said. It could be under the aegis of DHS with all agencies participating. But don't make it operational and don't connect it to operational entities because that's one of the beauties of NCTC is it you are, are more immune from influences that could be politically oriented where you can actually give your best judgments. Final word. Uh, Nikki, I'm not that concerned about the politicization of cyber. I'm worried about us not having the capabilities to defend the country from a cyber attack. And, and uh, everyone's heads will nod when we talk about the cyber threat, but then when you say, well, now can we empower the private sector, which was really on the front lines, to share information with the government, people say, oh, wait a second. And if you say, well, can we use some of the capabilities that NSA has to defend our country, people say, oh, wait a second. So, um, so I'm really worried about the capabilities, and I think as we from, from now till we meet next year uh, at this, in this beautiful place, I think the one thing this group can do is really figure out how to give the private sector and our government the capabilities to defend our country. It reminds me of the, 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 one of the um, impetuses for a lot of the recommendations in the original report was, of course, uh, Tenet's uh, famous memo where he said, we are at war, but yet he was not able to leverage the resources of the government on a war footing. And from what you're describing on cyber, we were in a similar situation. Um, and yet, it doesn't seem like we um, no. we really do. We're, most people believe we're at war. We don't, we don't want to wait. We yeah. don't want to wait until there is a cyber 9/11 or a cyber Pearl Harbor to galvanize our resources in the way that must be uh, done to protect ourselves. But Ryan, you know what the problem has been? This and when people make that argument, and, and I've done it myself, you get a pushback. Oh, you're being hysterical. The problem is almost we've had so many attacks. Uh, now, many, most of them are exploitation. It's stealing things, not actually destroying things. That it's a, a little bit like boiling a frog. It slowly, the temperature turns up. The frog never realizes it's getting boiled. And so we have to find a way. And again, it, it comes back to what I said earlier, specificity. When the Mandiant Report came out, yeah. when the US government, uh, you know, I don't know if John Carlin's still here, when they indicted these five guys in China, one of the advantages uh, was it gave you specific things you could talk about. Those of us who are you know, in, in the classified world know this stuff, but if you cannot talk to the American people and say, here's exactly what's happened, you're not going to get the message out. That's well, that's all we have time for. Thank you, gentlemen, very much for a great panel. Thank you. Thank you.
Great, 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 great